Greetings, citizens from the rolling hills of the bluegrass. I always seem to find them in my life. These leftists who generally don't like America. And I listened to another one the other day. It was a NPR interview with a person named Dr. Catherine Kinsler. And she wrote a book. And her book was about how accents and the way we perceive accents can change the way we view the people speaking. The name of the book is How You Say It. And, of course, from the leftist bent that she was obviously coming from, in the interview, which I'll link to at NPR, it talks about how, like, the heroes in books, or the heroes in movies, um, TV shows, sorry, the book talks about this, is that they're generally given a standard accent. Now, that's a very strange term, because there is no real standard accent for any people, except if you're in the West and you're comparing the standard accent to the one that we receive through the news, the non-regional diction accent, where they're trying to be as flat as possible. And if they were just giving straight news, that could be interesting, but it does make it feel a little impersonal. And it takes a whole lot of that non-regional diction uh, training to totally wipe out an accent in someone. And even me, I can remember from my youngest times, if you saw family videos, I had a twang that would go well on a guitar. But there was one incident right before I went into college where I had a professor email me. I had asked a question, and apparently my grammar was just atrocious, that instead of sending back an email with the answer to my question, they began to dissect and pick apart everything I had written and stated that if I wanted to be taken seriously, I needed to improve my grammar. That was kind of a punch in the face. And very quickly, very quickly, I started to do everything I could to get rid of my accent. And as I've gotten older, I find myself catching words here and there that come in and it's like, did I say for or fur? What did I do that for? What'd you do that for? And you, you find yourself, the faster you speak, the quicker you slide in to old habits. And that's interesting. That really is because they play a um, two versions of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. One while she was arguing in front of the Supreme Court, being very prim and proper, and then one while she is justice on the Supreme Court, and you hear her uh, Brooklyn accent come back into her speaking, because we're trying to be polite, proper, so that we can be taken seriously. Because again, like Bubba and Tyrone, the inner city accents, the boroughs of New York, they have their own tune that they speak to. And in some instances, it's not exactly the smartest sounding thing. Just like the twang in Eastern Kentucky or out here in Western Kentucky, it's not quite what most city folk want to hear. And then that comes forward to now where you're working with somebody. And that person is generally a leftist. Like I said, I normally find these people. And they kind of make the, the random comment. And you can tell that it's going to go in a direction because immediately the southern accent comes out. Now, this person 
is from the South. They've never lived anywhere else. But like me, they've made this effort to get rid of their accent. And yet, they try to put the accent down. And so anytime you need someone to sound uh, uneducated or stupid, what accent do you put on? Well, for most people, it's going to be a southern accent or a country accent. Sometimes they'll break it up and it's some kind of wise guy, New Jersey, New York, or maybe Boston meathead accent. But for the most part, it's a southern accent if you want to sound stupid. And it comes back to something even more primal to that because that person stated well that's because it's English and we believe we are better than everybody else so the very language that they're using to communicate they despise they hate and in the back of my mind I want to go but do you understand that English is a survivor English is a language of fighting to stay relevant. And because of English's later um, successes is the reason why so many speak it today. But there were three instances in the past where English could have just disappeared, gone away. And the, th the language that you and I speak now, that you're listening to me right now, could have been something closer to French. Could have been something closer to Latin. But that's never taken into account. Because English does something that a lot of lang languages do, but it does what I call the three A's. It adapts, it adopts, and it absorbs everything around it that comes in. If you speak English and you end a word with T-I-O-N, that's more than likely somewhere from France, from the French, from the Norman invasion. And if you're American, Australian, South African, all of your Englishes have words borrowed from the locals that were there before. You've borrowed and exchanged. So hating on English is is hating on the 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 little guy that grew up to be the big guy. The language that could have died out. And there, there's several other sources, but there's a, a book by a nam, man named Bill Bryson called The Mother Tongue. And that's where all of my interest started, was in that book. And then later you find um, the uh, PBS documentary called The Story of English, which is taken from, I believe, a BBC original. And it goes through all of this, where English is a survivor. It's adapting. It's trying to stay relevant. It's trying not to get thrown in under history and dominated by other languages so it adapts. Always changing in order to stay on the tongues of the people speaking it. And in Miss Kinsler's book, she talks about how um, if the protagonist speaks with that standard flat accent, then the villain is going to have an accent uh, that is different. And it's never specifically spoken of, but you can get the idea of what she's getting at. It's probably more than likely a Hispanic accent or an Asian accent or the Russian accent, but they still speak English unless it's subtitled at the bottom. And it totally <laughs> negates 
the years and years and years that if it was an American movie and there was a villain, that person was probably going to be speaking with an English accent. So, that angle of her book saying that we put accents on minorities in order to vilify them well then you're going to have to go back to the um, the silver age of movies and explain to me why every single one of those villains speaks with an English accent it's you know for for all of his current faults the comedian Eddie Izzard talks about Star Wars and how it's full of uh, destroyers and Death Stars, full of nothing but English-speaking actors. And there was a little flip with the movie Enemy at the Gates, where the good guys, the Russians, were given the English accent and the bad guys, the Germans, were given an American accent. There's a nice little flip there, kind of turning it around. That movie was also kind of made during that Middle War period. And so you can kind of read into the director a little bit there, but it's never been said. But you get the feeling that they're trying to make Americans out to be the villains by making the Nazis the American English-speaking villain. But that idea that, that accents are or language in general but accents because they're the most perceived element of language <laughs> denote villainy or ignorance or superiority well that that comes down from the academics because they expect a certain type, level, of written and spoken language. And if you do not meet their level, well, then you are lesser. And that goes into Appalachia, which is pertinent to the bluegrass. Because I used to be, in my time, when I was one of these moron socialists, I used to make the hideous comment that you could cut off the eastern part of Kentucky and give it back to Virginia and we would be better off. Isn't that terrible? Isn't that awful that I was like that at one point? Because I did exactly what the northerners did whenever they were trying to go through and find all the minorities that they could help they honed in on Appalachia and its poverty and it's terrible there but what Appalachia needed was jobs and infrastructure and instead what they did they went down there and they tried to destroy the language and the culture elocution studies for these poor Appalachian downtrodden yokels they need us, the Ivory Tower academics, to come and help them because listen to how they talk. My God, we must help them. And that was in the 70s. They came down and slowly started to try to chip away at these Appalachian towns. in what they believed was good for the betterment of these people but these people didn't need their their accent what they needed was jobs what they needed was infrastructure not some snooty professor coming down and taking pity on the poor mountain folk And it's funny because it's the same academics, the same ivory tower, ivory tower dwelling academics that talk about how hideous the Indian schools were, how hideous um, the destruction of African languages occurred. But then they do it to their own people. 
they use the same kind of degrading elements the put downs that the English did to the Welsh to the Irish that the Canadians and the Americans did to the Native Americans the Indians that the European powers did whenever they went into Africa and replaced those languages with French and English and German but oh no no we're the good people because we have degrees and we're here to help you poor yokels but we hate English because English is spoken by white people and white people are evil they are devils but we want to help these poor white people now reason me that one and again it means it's all just about power you turn hate into power and that's where we are yet again it all comes back to that who's in control who is in control really